and today it's my pleasure to moderate and to lead you throughout this uh, 16G uh, lecture that we are going through today. Uh, today our focus is on flexible programmer uh, infrastructures and we have eminent experts that will tell us about their experience and uh, we would like also to make sure that uh, whoever is in the audience has the opportunity to ask uh, participate in the discussion and animate a little bit uh, this day together. We will have a couple of hours together with us. So let me now share uh, a few slides just uh, to, um, I think, um, are you seeing my screen? Yes, we can see. Okay, great. And now I hope you see it in a presentation mode. No. No, as usual, it's um, voila. So, first of December, the last month of the year. Are you ready for the Christmas marathon? Well, uh, enjoying these uh, last few weeks, we um, are very glad to have today an expert panel and an expert group of uh, uh, eminent representatives uh, from different organizations in Europe that are active at the forefront of research and innovation in the areas of 5G to 6G uh, to discuss on flexible programmable infrastructures. As you know, the 16G Association is a nonprofit association that gathers more than 100 organizations from 25 different. <coughs> And um, I would like to remind you a few things before we get started. First of all, this session is recorded and will be published on the website, the 16G website. So in case you don't feel comfortable with the recording, be aware. Um, you can post at any time questions and comments in the chat that is uh, open. And in case you are participating also via social media to the discussions and, and echoing, let's say, the, the learnings and the insights that we will get today, uh, please use, uh, try to tag with 16G Open Lectures and tagging 16G Global, that is the channel of uh, the association. In case you have technical issues, we have a dedicated email, info at 16G.org. Now, I told you my name is Monique Calisti. I've been involved in um, 16G since its inception. Uh, together with my team and Martel, we have been involved and we are also members of this association. So for me, it's really a great pleasure to be here today. Now, the first speaker is Hen, I hope I pronounced correctly, right? It's Henning Schulzrin, a uh, professor, um, professor of computer and science at Columbia University is joining us from the US. Thank you so much, Henning. And I give you the floor to possibly also introduce yourself and give us a little bit of a flavor of what you're doing before you enter into your presentation. 
So um, thanks a lot for being here. The stage is yours. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So it's a little earlier here. So <laughs> let me share my screen. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm I'm working at Columbia University. I've also had a background in uh, some of the regulatory and policy agencies within the United States, uh, the Federal Communications Commission and the U.S. Senate. Uh, so I'm typically coming at the communications issues, not just as a technologist, but also maybe as somebody who sees the side that is more of a, a policy and uh, maybe even political side of things. So today I, I am going to be speaking a little bit from a perspective of a uh, more, if you want to call it philosophical uh, notion of 6G uh, or what 6G could look like, because I do believe there is a unique opportunity to fix what I think has been uh, a well-intentioned but in largely industry structure given development of uh, my net of previous generations which has been successful, but probably has reached its natural limit. Indeed, I think one of the difficulties that 6G has found itself in, at least in the discussions that I've participated in, that it's been hard beyond kind of the usual menagerie of buzzwords like AR, VR, ML, which now all seem to blend into one sentence, I to have a real clear definition beyond just the usual multiply everything by 10 effort to define as a unique identity and as a unique effort what a next generation wireless access network will be. So I want to take a step back and look at really some old lessons, which I think largely have been forgotten, ignored, maybe just are not quite uh, as pertinent seeming as they might have been in the early days of developing networks. But I do believe they're worth getting back to. So I'll briefly, uh, given time available, talk about three aspects that I think should guide the development of 6G philosophically and maybe also because of the technologies that we now have available, namely layering, controllability, and modularity. One of the first things I want to emphasize is that it behooves us as a technical community in particular to be uh, quite um, kind of modest in our predictions. And this includes obviously myself, as in we've usually been pretty bad about predicting what a generation is actually used for. So we typically have all these pronouncements as to what a generation is defined by, cellular generation. And now just to take one example or two examples, and I think IMS, Internet Multimedia Subsystem, was seen as the defining feature for 4G. Uh, but what really drove adoption of it was the smartphone and over-the-top applications. Similarly, for 5G, there was a lot of discussion about low latency. I have yet to see any large-scale URLC applications uh, or deployments. Uh, but what seems to be commercially successful, at least in the United States, is fixed wireless access using the capacity provided by 5G. What has been a constant is the geometric decrease, very roughly speaking, of the cost per gigabyte delivered. So I believe that 6G needs to continue that move towards lower cost data, be the cheapest wireless access bit pipe that one can build, and that includes, in particular, uh, decreasing the cost of operations, not just the cost of deployment, because increasingly the cost of operating a network will not be driven by hardware, it will be driven by software and people, namely the ones that have to operate it on in that. So what has changed if we go back even further, because if you think of 4G and 5G, the architecture really is not fundamentally different than what we had in 3G. Yes, we have now more a cloud-based architecture in 5G, 
But the notion of, mo of modules that reside in a carrier operated uh, computing and access facility is pretty much the same as it was in 3G. Well, we have now a number of technology developments. We now have global navigation systems that are cheap and universal. Every device has it. That wasn't the case in 3G. We have multiple simultaneous connections that we can maintain uh, because we, every device has many, many radios built in in that, um, including obviously Wi-Fi and, and Bluetooth, but also multiple cellular radios uh, you can use. Voice is increasingly less dominant as an application. Calling it a smartphone is really misleading. It's really mostly used for nomadic and uh, uh, applications that can typically tolerate short disruptions like streaming because they're buffer and that. We have a security infrastructure uh, that is much better. We now have uh, zero cost, essentially, certificates in that when, I mean, 3G and I mean, even 2G was around. Uh, SIMs were kind of the hardware SIMs were the epitome of trust models. Uh, and now we have much better options in that. And they are much less complicated than some of the eSIM stuff, too. And on devices, we have trusted execution environments. Uh, again, something which didn't really exist in a phone type of model, except by kind of just physical protection that you couldn't get at the software at all. And importantly, we have now a increasing deployment of fiber to the home, uh, which means that fiber is now widely and geographically widely available including increasingly in rural areas. Uh, so that the notion that you have to have special base stations that are connected by fiber provided by a provider is no longer the only model. Uh, so that enables distributed ownership of a network infrastructure. You attach it to existing network infrastructures as opposed to building a separate one in that. And we see initial efforts like Helium that may or may not be successful, but they will they illustrate that you can uh, design network infrastructures that are not operated in the traditional carrier by tower model. Indeed, what has changed is that the, the whole architecture of what we think of as a carrier is no longer quite what it was. The first four generations largely had carriers that were vertically integrated provided a lot of their own technology. If they didn't, they at least branded it as in you would buy a phone. And at least in the United States and Europe, that hasn't been quite as much the case as much. But in the United States, you would only buy your phone from the carrier store because you needed a CDMA phone, say, I and not. And the carrier would largely operate the whole infrastructure, including everything from applications, voice largely, text, um, to uh, the, the retail store, to network operations. But that's no longer the case either. Even though we still have a single brand as the carrier, it's largely just now, um, I like to say it's the equivalent of an airline, as in they buy the, the planes, they use the airports that are provided by others, and what they provide is largely branding. Um, and that, and some and personnel, the flight attendants, if you like. And that's very much the carrier model now. Uh, in that they rely largely on external applications, on devices developed by other companies. They may outsource the, even the operation of networks, and certainly backbones and towers and so on are now typically leased uh, as opposed to owned by the carriers. So we have a disaggregated carrier model but the operation and design of a network still seems to assume that we have a traditional 1990-type carrier um, operating everything in an integrated way. We also have new operator models. So in the United States, the, uh, the most successful new entrants into the mobile space are cable companies. Um, they have recognized that they can provide through a combination of roaming agreements with traditional carriers and bulk purchase agreements, type of MVNO agreements, 
I, but also increasingly using CBRS with 3.5 gigahertz band that is more widely available to non-traditional entities and Wi-Fi to create a, a price competitive product for consumers in particular. Again, a, uh, a network operator that has uh, infrastructure available, um, has the resources available to manage uh, customer relationships, but is not seen generally as a traditional wireless network operators as we have no tradition in that field. But they are now one of the more successful new entrants, at least in the United States. We also have new efforts I uh, have been much more successful than the carrier IoT efforts, namely kind of bottom-up um, IoT networks, in particular the LoRa network as one example of that, where you have thousands, tens of thousands of devices, both through the Things Network and Helium and other eff similar efforts that provide coverage in that. Indeed, I, as an illustration of the different deployment model, this is a picture of some of my students installing our LoRa node, which then provides coverage at no cost to uh, Upper Manhattan uh, in, in our area near Columbia University. In, again, we're not a carrier. We didn't have to register as a carrier, but we are now effectively acting as an IoT carrier, except that whoever uses it is not paying for the services because it is so cheap for us to offer the service, it wouldn't really be worth charging for it. The old model, whether this is before G model that we're all familiar with, uh, dozens of interfaces, but they all assume largely that all these green boxes are operated by the same entity. And then there is this kind of small bubble internet at the right. And the 5G model is different, but it largely takes the same approach that you assume that you just stick those onto cl a cloud-based infrastructure into some Kubernetes um, model or whatever you might use for that. And uh, again, tightly integrated, uh, only really useful when you think of the operator of this entities on the slide being a single, very large, typically carrier or some outsourced entity. So what do we want to do uh, going forward, I believe? Namely, we should separate the link layer from the network architecture. That's been the principle of the internet from the 1970s. We just have forgotten that in mobile networks. So why shouldn't I just, um, the new radio type model, for example, operate on a home router? We must make sure that every interface can be tested and self-tested. Uh, and uh, that's typically not the case. I, all the interfaces that are listed, all the kind of the blue, oops, wrong direction, all like the little bubbles that are on this, the 29 something or other, currently are only available to a carrier. In a good network, I believe they should, with proper access control, be available to anybody who needs it. Uh, and, uh, so that the consumer, the application vendor, an oper a non-traditional operator and that. Clean interfaces, uh, so that layer two and three can function without lots of other things that you may not need. And unlike what 5G does, where you have a megabyte configuration file, uh, we never ever should have configuration files again and obviously no hard-coded addresses. I won't have time to go through this, but I believe even though 5G and 6G have spent a lot of effort on concentrating on uh, the phi layer and its capabilities, that other properties, universality, uh, the low incremental cost, uh, data and the network architecture, management of users and system management are becoming increasingly the dominant factor, not just what modulation scheme you're using. Indeed, one of the principal difficulties of these type of systems is not how we can scale a small network to a big one, but how can we small down, uh, scale down? Namely, can we build simple small networks uh, that then can scale up if necessary, but you can start small because by definition, all networks start small, unless man, you roll out a carrier style network and you have billions of dollars to invest. Indeed, I believe that 
Wi-Fi is a good example of such a network in the sense that we have the most simplest network with a single device that you buy for I mean, 50 euros in a local store and serves an apartment all the way up to very large scale, like an airport scale or uh, a roaming agreement scale uh, model for a uh, deployment with hundreds and thousands of access points in that, and with mesh and other uh, kind of intermediate architectures in between. Uh, that architecture currently is difficult to support in traditional carrier architecture and traditional 5G architectures. So in particular, that means that we need to have a system where a, we should think of the RAN not as a radio access network, but as the stripped down version, namely an access point that can work standalone, that provides an Ethernet interface that does not require mobility because if you have a private network, you may not need it. No gateways are needed because you're directly connected to the internet. No network function virtualization because you're not operating that. You don't need a cloud service. Uh, no eSIMs and similar complex authentication and no tunnels ever. That in also in particular means that we have no cross layer dependency. Uh, and that we can assume that everything has an API I, and the devices are identified by an IPv6 address. That also means that we should rethink how we control these network. Uh, I think the network control approach that the cloud providers are currently doing is much more successful than the NetConf and Yang model, uh, simply because it allows an individual setting of parameters in that in a way that is familiar to developers and can be easily used as opposed to creating a new thing which is only used for network devices. Uh, any device should be self-placing. If I attach a home router under at least normal circumstances, it finds its network attachment point it gets whatever information for DHCP in that case that it needs to operate. It provides the same information or similar information to its devices. And I, besides setting up a password, which shouldn't be necessary to begin with in a Wi-Fi environment, I'm, I don't have to do anything. So we need to think of how we can build networks which basically self-configure from the get-go uh, in that. And I believe this is now technically possible. So what made Wi-Fi in particular successful as the dominant mobile data delivery technology by volume? By far, at least in the United States, most data is not delivered over 4G, 5G. It is delivered by Wi-Fi by, by a factor of three or four. Namely, architectural flexibility, uh, multiple authentication models, the minimum viable functionality, which is indeed at the 50 euro level, and international usability from that. And I want to, since I have a limited amount of time, I want to just talk about one thing that often does not get appreciated how important it is. Namely, one of the most important things for building a particularly private network, which is apparently I mean, one of the things that should make 5G successful, is that it has a range of authentication models. Namely, one is starting where you have essentially what you might call picket fence security, which is kind of your cafe Wi-Fi type thing where you don't really try very hard to keep people out, but for whatever reason you want to not have everybody use the network to just providing a password to a WPA2 style model, which is a bit more secure for like a home or small enterprise environment to a radius or diameter authentication, all the way to an international roaming mechanism, which we know as EduRoam, uh, which provides, without having a GSMA size organization, provides international roaming uh, among educational institutions using standard Wi-Fi techniques. In particular, the second aspect that we often don't talk about is that while we talk about protocols and need to talk about them, programmability matters more. Nobody wants to program raw, TCP, QUIC, or anything else. Indeed, you could argue that in networking, the advances that we have experienced were largely driven by the ability of non-network engineers to create applications. 
starting in the 1980s with the socket APIs, uh, two much more high level abstractions in that. We've clearly fallen short for mobile networks. Um, we provide them on the end systems, but all attempts to really control that functionality by APIs have not really been all that successful in that. And indeed, this is one reason why I believe that systems such as LoRa tend to be more successful for, say, IoT applications, simply because they're more readily programmable by ordinary programmers without the permission of the carrier. Right? And not. And in particular, that means that carrier-specific technologies are no longer a viable option, simply because we won't have people who want to learn this type of stuff. Is I mean, Who wants to work for lifelong for a carrier? That's no longer a career path in that. Let me conclude. I'm, the notion is that the opportunity that 6G offers is not just to rethink the FI, but to go back to first principles of having a simple, managed, easily managed, downscalable network uh, in that. I, the incentive, I believe, for 6G is not new ARVL, whatever functionality. It is simply providing lower cost per bit. Uh, and so the architecture that needs to support that requires a rethink, not just doing whatever the latest cloud technology is. In particular, that it requires a rethink of a model of a carrier bubble, uh, it requires a rethink of a control plane, and it requires a rethink of a network access model. And lessons can be learned, I believe, from both Wi-Fi and LoRa as successful lower complexity models uh, that might inform uh, the network architectures and protocols uh, that we might look for in 6G. Thank you. Sorry, I was mute. Thank you very much, Henny. I think we've got a good overview of a number of aspects that in fact require some more reflection, some more work in the community. And here I see a question in the chat, if I may ask you, that is about um, controllability. So you mentioned um, with regard to controllability, you mentioned something and the um, question is, do you know of any promising industry trends or standardization efforts? Henning? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I, to be honest, not as a standardization effort, I, in that, I'm, what I do see is that all the large cloud providers, so when the big three basically, all seem to converge to this, a similar model of essentially a restful uh, communication interface uh, in that, so that it has a a, a model which we are familiar with in terms of programming, where we control the cloud infrastructure, controlling instances, setting up instances, setting up email servers and uh, whatever else we need, event bridges and all the other functions, network related functions, upper layer functions in that, in the same way. Uh, in that. So I think this is largely still the RESTful model, but I don't know of any standards-based effort, which still seem to be a much more traditional, like a MIB-style model in that, which I don't think works nearly as well from a programming perspective uh, in that. So yeah, I'd be curious if anybody else has seen any interesting things in there. Thank you, Henry. I... Thank you. Mm -hmm. Indeed, I was going to suggest that anyone in the audience can, of course, make suggestions or make comments if they might be aware of anything that is relevant to this point. There is actually another question for you, Henning. That is, um, uh, in your opinion, what should uh, 6G become? Uh, the same access network only type of system or uh, should, it be, should it be conceived as a system providing full services? Yep, so when there's the old fear that every carrier seems to have, that they only become a bit pipe. But what seems to happen is that uh, they are essentially bit pipes. They just don't seem to want to realize it. Uh, and uh, so, yes, I would argue that the notion of providing full services 
I, given that carriers have no history of working with developers uh, and making their life easy, uh, and that and actually in most cases have very little internal culture of doing so. Um, it's basically packaged services as opposed to the more developer-friendly models that uh, other entities have been pursuing. And uh, I believe focusing on things that carriers do well, namely reliability and access um, and a secure infrastructure in that is much more promising than trying to become a nimble operator or a replacement for um, an application provider in that. I think there's evidence of that. that when I seen this, I was looking at IoT applications. Uh, some of the carriers in the US used to actually to try to provide uh, developer services. I could not find anything useful in there. All they were doing, trying to do is sell uh, integrated services to large companies, typically. I don't think that's a successful model. Um, and that, as again, I think the I are struggling IoT efforts, which are inherently an indicator of all the thousands of little applications that have a few users each, or a few companies each, uh, it illustrate it just at least in the US have not been successful in breaking into that market. So yes, be of the best access network that you can. Thank you, Henning. Actually, there's there's another question that uh, relates to the fact to the link layer and the network layer. So so how can we get rid of node and function configuration if we can? Yep. Um yep, and that is um I don't have a, a, let me punt and say this is an open research problem. Indeed, uh, several of the people here uh, on, uh, on the seminar this morning were just at a dark school seminar where we've been pondering this very question uh, in, in the context of network automation. Uh, in that. I believe this is a, uh, there's a two part uh, answer to that uh, in rough outline, namely that the device itself should assume to be generic and I might identify itself to whatever its service provider of the moment happens to be, possibly several. So it may this may not be a one-one relationship. And that service provider I should indicate its necessary function to it. Again, in a primitive way, we do this by DHCP. We don't have to configure, generally speaking, once we set up a Wi-Fi password, again, which should not be necessary to begin with. That's really a, a legacy artifact in that, that we're struggling to overcome. But generally, that man, once you configure a device in your home, you don't have to touch the network configuration under normal circumstances. And I believe we can extend that to other network elements, kind of a zero trust model equivalent that we're talking about, just like no network element, even inside the carrier network, should necessarily inherently trust others just because they're connected, uh, is that they should get information as to what they need to do in the network uh, based on uh, kind of distributed systems principles of my name. Hey, I'm a generic compute capability. What I'm just in the network. What do I need to do here today? I, oh, I'm a right. DNS server today. Let me download the, uh, let me download the services I need. Again, that. So I believe we know roughly how to do it. We just don't have the standards to make this happen at scale. Thank you. Thank you so much, Henning. Um, I'm sorry I have to close this uh, intervention here because we have a tight schedule. Thank you so much. Um, for any other question, I recommend the audience to contact directly Henning. And now uh, I will pass to the next speaker. Thanks a lot, Henning, again, for having joined us uh, from far away. Um, now we have uh, Diego, Lo Diego Lopez. Um, senior technology expert at Telefonica R&D, and today we'll talk about Jabber working on cloud networks. Diego, the cloud, the, the cloud, the stage is yours. Is your. <laughs> Sorry, I was uh, I was trying to, to mute. 
Uh, what I was saying that if you want to give me the cloud, I would be more than happy to, to own it. Anyway, can hear you can, and see you perfectly. <laughs> perfect. You can you can call me Diego Besos from, from now on. Uh, okay, so well, just, just as an introduction, maybe uh, uh, some of you know me. I have been working in Telefonica for the last 11 years. I was precisely hired by... Uh, I was working in the academic networking in, in the Giant project concretely, and I was hired by Telefonica because they were starting a unit focusing on the new opportunities related to uh, uh, SEN, NFV, network programmability, software networks, cloud networks, whatever. whatever. Apart from that, I am um, I'm very fond of literature in particular and a, and a great admirer of uh, Lewis Carroll. And that's why you have here this uh, Jabberwocky. For those of you, I mean, for those of you, uh, excuse me, those of you who know what uh, Jabber, the Jabberwocky is, the Jabberwocky is a, is a, a parody of an of a, um, epic poem that was uh, that appears in, in one of the uh, um, Alice books of, uh, of Lewis Carroll. As a reference material, you have it at the end of this presentation. It is the, the text, the complete text of the, of the, uh, uh, of the Jabberwocky. And well, the whole thing is structured as a well, sort of a, this kind of epic fight with a with a with a horrible uh, monster um, that uh, has to do with how we deal with the uh, challenges that we have right now uh, for providing uh, network services and uh, how the convergence with the, with the current practice in, in IT uh, could help us, and which are the uh, requirements that we have here. This is something that, uh, as you can see here, is something that is there. Uh, by, by the way, th there are some uh, sites of the, of the Jabberwocky, a little bit uh, uh, change uh, for you in some of the uh, slides, just as a, as a matter of fun. Uh, so uh, uh, this is something that this has happened. As, as, as I said, I was hired by Telefonica uh, some time ago because there were the, the, the interest in how to program or make the, the uh, this convergence between the uh, IT and, and, and technologies that were right. there dealing with virtualization and, and, and the uh, initial uh, steps of the cloud. And the, uh, this convergence was uh, quite interesting for, for network providers. But what is true is that this is something that has happened for quite a long time. If you think about uh, a router, it's no, it's no more than a computer with additional, um, um, with, with any, uh, additional features and different characteristics because the goals that the router has are precisely different from what is, uh, is uh, for general, uh, uh, a general purpose computer or the same in the in general in, in general it there are layering principles but they are not so strict so uh they are, they are not enforced in a so strong way as they uh, as they are uh, enforced uh, in, the, in networking and uh well the, this goes a little bit beyond the typical uh, tussle that we have had so many times between the uh, uh, the telcos as, as big uh, big companies uh, addressing um, billions of users and the hyperscalers as big companies addressing many, in many cases, the same billions of, of users. It's not that uh, we can solve it by uh, all telcos becoming like hyperscalers or all hyperscalers becoming to, uh, coming to telco space. Things are a little bit more complex and the, uh, the different cases, scenarios, the many niches that with the generalization of, of networking and the, uh, the networking applications that, are, that is still growing is something that will have or will require uh, interesting changes. Basically, what we are doing is uh, addressing the enormous complexity challenge that is associated with, uh, with the uh, evolution of networking, with the different uh, or many applications of networking from the good old days of the uh, telegram networks to the uh, telephone that uh, had enough with, uh, with transmitting voices, etc. The, uh, the, uh, the, there are a certain set of, uh, of trends that are very important, uh, apart from the, uh, the, the uh, typical uh, problems about the densification and the number of devices, et cetera, what is, uh, and the, the problems about automation, et cetera. 
there are two things that are extremely important. What is that the user experience demand heterogeneity by definition? We cannot, it's impossible that you expect that in the future, everything is gonna be, all the pot potential uses of the network can be addressed with a unified way of, uh, of, uh, of connecting, of providing connectivity, basic services, connectivity and security or whatever else with a, with a single and, and, and totally homogeneous approach. This is something that is, is, I believe is clear and we have to deal with that. And uh, on the other hand, we are obliged uh, because of the very nature of the, of the network to be distributed. We cannot rely on highly centralized uh, solutions. And this combined with the other aspects uh, regarding the, uh, uh, the densification, et cetera, makes things that makes that the complexity is growing at a let's say exponential rate, and that implies well that there are a certain a set of of uh, of, uh, of paths in which we are we're moving on right now regarding building a more dynamic, agile, scalable, um, elastic uh, infrastructures providing services that can satisfy these complexity challenges. And you have here the, 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 the number of, of those that we are going to address uh, today about uh, microservices, about everything as a service, about the different, the functional integration of the different elements, or how we can extend security, and goals that are desirable, though we are not yet there and they are subject of, uh, of research, like, for example, applying DevOps uh, principles in the, uh, in the uh, network operation, the uh, possibility of having a, a, a total continuum between the network and the and computer, uh, the computers, and, and realizing this uh, old uh, motto of uh, the network is the computer, and everything that is around the intense zero touch, uh, smart networks, etc. And all this, the promise of our promised land in, uh, right now is cloud native. So everything has to be cloud native. Everything has to be. Uh, if it is cloud native, it's good. In despite of that, in general, cloud nativeness has a quite circular definition so far. It's difficult to define what is cloud native, what makes an application cloud native, what makes a, a piece of a network of a network function or a network itself cloud native. It's because it's something like a cloud native is something that can run on the cloud. Uh, but the cloud is something that is changed. So the cloud native is changing and, and it's whatever can run on my cloud is cloud native, but it's cloud native of my cloud and not necessarily of the cloud as, a, as an entity. And it, uh, be, it has become a totally uh, moving target, but is a, well, it's a strong motivation for, for, the, for the transformation. Which is important as well is to do this and to become cloud native. It's not enough just following the uh, experience in, in other, in other fields like, I don't know, corporate databases or, or a customer relationship systems or whatever, because networks have particular properties that are not exactly the same and in other kind of, of, um, <clears throat> of environments. Basically you have the, the, these five, one is it's, uh, the, the topology and geometry awareness, well, and even geography awareness, you cannot separate well, you can separate to, to some extent, but you cannot separate the antenna from the mobile users. You cannot centralize everything relying only on that. The, uh, things happen at the speed of light because the speed of light is limited and uh, among other things. And, 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 and you need to reach the users and the users want, want to be reached and followed by the, by the network services. Second is what they call the conservation principle. Uh, uh, the uh, network is not a set of calculations in which you put a, a small input and get a, um, a high amount of output. You have to, whatever comes into the network has to go out more or less in the same proportion that changes the way in which you can design the, uh, the, the general um, infrastructures. Network has to be radically open they are, we are mandated and the value of a network and Henry was mentioning this depends very much on how many people is connected to the network, how many people, how many different people can use it. It has to be, it's a critical system. It has to be, uh, has to warranty integrity and has to warranty auditability. And finally has to warranty isolation. The idea that uh, our communications can be independent and are not going to, to uh, interfere 
with uh, one another. And there is a set of boxes or, or, or ways of thinking that we try to, to or we should try to change if we think, uh, need, uh, want this to happen. First is something that is uh, the cloud equivalent to Moore's law. Moore's law, as you know, is something that is, is, is uh, well, no, it's not a natural law, as it's something that was identified about the increasing capacity of the of processors, doubling it every uh, every period. I don't remember two years or or something like that. So you could make software more and more complex. Uh, as uh, and, and the same case has been happening with the uh, with, with the cloud as well. Just adding capacity, you were able to deal with stronger or heavier workloads in different uh, in, a, in a satisfactory way. But it's not so clear that this is uh, applicable as well to, to networks because of the five uh, uh, feature uh, characteristics that we were talking before and because uh, the, the uh, uh, principles or, or the scalability patterns that are applicable to compute to computations are not necessarily the same that you can apply to a network. And it's not clear to me either that this uh, as, as Moore's law itself uh, for processors is gonna hold forever for the case of the cloud. On the other hand, there is a, there has been a long tradition or at least a tradition of a couple of decades minimum of, uh, of uh, going against the uh, good uh, Ockham racers principles and the, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, practice in networking has been ex extremely focus on over architecting over standardized over standardized architectures uh, creating hierarchies where collaboration and autonomy is is would have been much more interesting etc even the internet itself that was born, born at, um, as a highly decentralized uh, infrastructure is becoming more and more centralized more and more not like this kind of uh, of set of autonomous systems that are that are in in the, uh, uh, the that are collaborating so and another thing is about identities this is becoming more and more knowing who you are talking to knowing the uh, trust you can put on some on, on the other side of the communication is uh, is essential it's not only about the, the people it's about whatever the service whatever the, the tenants of those services over the infrastructure whatever the users uh, uh, humans or not and uh, well, uh, the, the, the quest for solutions to the uh, security quantum thread as well. And we need, for that, we need uh, to go in a, ahead of the, uh, in the virtualization trail that we started, as I said, uh, 12, 10 years ago, beyond the initial uh, uh, VM focused approaches. And that includes uh, thinking about uh, microservices and enhancing, going in the same direction, that is true, current IT practice or current cloud practices demonstrated in, in building services in a more agile um, and uh, scalable way. There are different approaches and it's not so that we should only go microservices or Kubernetes or whatever. We can think about uh, tiny five virtual machines, unikernels and similar approaches that uh, could support this. And because of the specific characteristics of the network, and the specific characteristics of some of the uh, potential um, uh, user scenarios would be more adequate than, than uh, containers. And something that is important as well is that to, to go beyond in the disaggregation path that was started with softwareization. So it's not only about the disaggregation, the, the uh, all run, for example, disaggregation of the antenna and the, uh, the processing capacity is about disaggregating the uh, uh, packets from, uh, fr from flows and, and being uh, building a, a path awareness, dealing on with uh, packet extensions that help the programmability and go, well, uh, something that is uh, now starting with uh, every, uh, everything around segment routing, but I believe this uh, needs to go beyond. And um, that includes other aspects uh, regarding considering new architecture principles, thinking that the orchestration is not only affecting the data plane, but as well should impact the control plane with a, with a dynamic control composition that would be 
key if we want to retake again the old uh, uh, paradigm that was so successful of the uh, of the network of networks that it was originally the internet and being aware of the uh, needs for acceleration because we are talking about that almost real time environment in which well this is uh, becomes essential that uh, when we, we try to translate it to, to programmability we have two dimensions with, with one is the uh, we're trying to work on vertical programmability so users of the network and here when we're talking about the users we are not necessarily talking about the end users with their mobile phone uh, programming the network uh, it's true that no, well, the vast majority of the potential users of the networks are not programmers, and the vast majority of the programmers are not aware of the network or, or the network uh, uh, subtleties. So the idea is that here, when talking about users, is whoever wants to run a program that is able to somehow interact with the network in a way that currently is not, uh, is not uh, uh, possible, uh, possible in most cases because we are dealing with uh, fixed uh, established uh, services, but the idea is to have the possibility of making some, uh, uh, some requests at the high level about the, uh, what you need from the network and that can be translated down in terms of, oh, sorry, uh, that, can, that, that can be translated down the stack into something that, uh, at the end, using using standardized interfaces can translate into interacting with the uh, with the network um, uh, with uh, with the different network devices. And the second dimension, the horizontal one, is is precisely about being able to integrate the different mechanisms for network programmability for network uh, uh, softwareization, so we can combine the uh, uh, programmability of the at, the at the network device level with the capacity of assigning the uh, <clears throat> part of the of the processing to virtualized functions that have, can be deployed one here and there. Henning was mentioning this idea of a general device that when uh, a certain moment can be used as a DNS server and in a certain moment as a as a firewall, for example, and this is in the in the in the in the uh, at the at the, uh, at the basis of these uh, the ideas around what uh, made us create uh, NFE and what is ne necessary and we are not there yet is this full uh, merging of the capacities of NFE and the capacities of SDN as, uh, as you see at the, in this uh, evolutionary path uh, that, the, that, the peer, that the peer here. So we can go from uh, something that is important as well is to, to start to forget about tunneling uh, and forget about uh, overlays on overlays on overlays built by uh, for whatever the reason and start thinking that uh, that we can do that and we can do that in a much more efficient way by having programmable elements that can be somehow hinted or controlled by uh, certain aspects that, that that appear in the in the data flow itself for this, uh, something that is a challenge is precisely the homogenization. We have many different uh, styles and mechanisms right now for providing programmability and for to accelerating this programmability. And we need something that would be somehow similar to, if you want, to an to a, to a, to a operating system kernel that allows us to interact with the different device. Uh, mechanisms in a consistent way not in a unique way but in a in a consistent way the same way we do right now with the different elements in a in a computer when it comes to security we should not forget and, uh, and it's something that i'm insisting from the very beginning whatever makes the network programmable whatever makes the network based on software requires to go beyond the current security practices because we are entering a totally new uh, uh, territory where you cannot rely on the um, on the on the on the physical uh, access control and that includes securing the control plane and securing the links securing the data plane as well and, sec and securing in a consistent way how the different functions are communicating where and wh whenever 
or and wherever they go, and being aware that uh, we need uh, to make a transition to, to quantum safe. And it's not only about deciding which is the algorithm, the, the coolest algorithm has to has a very strong implications regarding uh, management and uh, having early standards to avoid problems here in, in the interpretation of the different security me uh, measures. Trust is essential as well in a, in a world in which everything becomes programmable and dynamic and software based and that includes attestation, that includes attestation not only of the programs but of the and that of the topologies, which is something that we have been we have been working in the past and we are still interesting in, interested in, in progressing, which is about how you can prove that the connection the, the packets move in the uh, uh, following the path that you were that, that you uh, uh, were intended they, they were intended to use, and uh, when it comes to supply chains. Supply chains are becoming more and more important, and, and the uh, and, and providers of network services will become more and more dependent on that. Uh, that the software supply chain is secure and can be uh, applied in the end to end, and uh, and we are able to go to the this idea of the of DevOps, in which we can we have to rely on this uh, on this move and the, on the. Uh, capability of this supply chain to be as much automated as possible. And there is a one single pipeline from the, uh, from the developer to, uh, to, uh, uh, to the deployment on the network, rethinking the certification, the current certification process, processes that are right now extremely lengthy and complicated. And something that is essential for this is that we find ways of divining and this is why I talk about serious science and serious engineering, because if we are totally consistent in the way in which we define experiments, we will be able to be totally uh, consistent in the way in which we define test and validation mechanisms. And we have repeatable results because we have uh, methods that are reproducing. Just uh, uh, I'm trying to conclude, trying to go uh, faster, is about the, uh, the, the importance of the edge and the importance of how we are able to provide services at the edge of the network, the places in which external programmers could use, Henning was sitting about IoT programmers, and, and I fully agree with him that the IoT programmers don't care about the network, about the network subtleties, et cetera. And this is why there is a, there is a proposal for evolving towards something that uh, right now inside the ITF is called in-network computing. This, this idea that you have a common platform on which you can run your, your applications, you have a consistent interface there and you can move your application in, what, in whatever dimension, among, uh, across different providers, across different network segments if it's required, across different application environments. So you, can, you have something that is consistently able to uh, be run all over, uh, all over the network and provide this idea of a, service continuum in which very likely will be the facilitators it will be the uh, the provide the infrastructure we are not all, or at least i don't think it would be a, a wise move try to control the, the whole process but it's precisely having an open environment uh, for facilitating a, an ecosystem of developers and users and for this the idea would be to use intent. I mean, again, which is something that appears when it's, and again about what is intent, how is intent. Our idea or the idea that we are, we are working with is that intent is, uh, should be a highest level, uh, 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 sorry, a programming language at a, a highest level. It's not that you can express whatever, it's that you have a control vocabulary, but this, the kind of, of, uh, of uh, vocabulary vocabulary that could be um, uh, useful for a, for a programmer of these uh, in this continuum. For this, what we have in, in mind right now is start working with the idea of combining on the one hand smart contracts, on the other hand intent and expressions. So uh, the intent exp expressions in the, uh, the, the boot become a particularization of Particularization of, yeah, uh, parameterization of 
proposal of smart contracts made by the providers and consumed by the, uh, by the, uh, by the users. The, the advantage of this is that then you have a dynamic book library because it would be defined by the, by the services and their parameters that are controlled by the users because they can choose the, the parameterization and that can be automatically enforced. So you have a, a automatic uh, SLA verification. And just to conclude, just, uh, just to remind you that what we're trying to do is precisely uh, evolve towards uh, the cloud promised land in which uh, the, this full convergence of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, IT technologies and uh, programming and the, uh, the networking necessities will be there. We started some time ago and uh, I normally say that it was the reason why I'm, I am working where I'm working right now starting around NEC and uh, an SEM, but we are moving ahead while addressing, trying to address full programmability and at the end, uh, having this continuum in which we will be able to, hopefully to build a um, healthy ecosystem. Uh, well, just for you, as I said, as, as, as reference material here, you have the, the, the original Jabberwocky for your entertainment and in the in the uh, with the hope that you have enjoyed this uh, this talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Diego. Very inspiring. A lot of interesting uh, points that, as you said, require more work, more attention, and uh, that are indeed in the agenda of many of the researchers and innovators in this community. Um, I think you know. Uh, well, I put now on the chat. Uh, 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 what Alice said about jabberwalking uh, after having read the poem. Uh, so, well, uh, there's one question that came from the audience and then I have a, a question or a comment. So the question that came from the audience is, careers are classically obsessed with avoiding vendor locking, lock-ins. Lock how would you see the evolution of this classical requirement in the era of virtual network functions? Can virtual net network functions be provided from or by different hyperscalers? Well, they, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what we expect is that the network functions will not only be provided by hyperscalers. Exactly, because that would be that would be another another kind of uh, of logging. But on it, the uh, the in the original conception of uh, of NFT, the idea was that the network functions should be provided by anyone with the capacity of producing the network function, maintaining it, and, and supporting it. And that's what we are struggling for. It's true that the uh, well, you you start the uh, all the move with a, with a, something in, in mind. And then, well, there are particularities, there are requirements on the infrastructures. There are even from time to time tricks uh, that are played because I don't like this other provider. I mean, I am a vendor. I don't like, I would not like to collaborate with these other vendors. So I make my, my function a little bit incompatible with, uh, with theirs. So, but uh, the idea of having networks based on software, networks that are programmable is to advance in the possibility that almost anyone that can demonstrate that it has something that is running, et cetera, can be selected as one of the providers of the, of the function. I'm, I'm confident that we, we will find a way of enforcing this for sure. Thank you very much, uh, Diego. I see that there is another question on the chat and I'm really here. Uh, as we move from in-network compute to edge computer integration, what do you believe should be specified or agreed upon for this new inter-computing system to work? Well, I, well if, we, we, uh, if we agree in a, in a state of basic communication patterns, et cetera, that is something that I, I assume is the case. We have, we have IP, we have, uh, well, TCP and QUIC right now. We have uh, REST APIs in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in these cases. So if we agree on that, the other thing that need to be, uh, needs to be agreed is on, the, on data models. 
on how the data that is going to be exchanged is going to be modeled so they are consistent. One thing, I'm not saying that we need to agree on the data syntax, but we have to, to agree on how when we connect it or we're willing to consume some data that is provided by, a, by another party, whether how we can uh, read and know uh, what the uh, format of the data that we're going to receive uh, mean. Somehow, and it's, and, and it's a, a funny or well, funny or, or, or interesting convergence of the theories that if those of you who are old enough would remember about the semantic web and the web 2.0 and ABF and ontologies, et cetera, is taking place right now uh, in, in, at, other, and, uh, at other levels. And it's something that was started curiously by some people working with uh, IoT. And we are we are finding a, a, we are looking at the convergence of the way of describing data, and I believe that this is the, what we need in the future, not specific and detailed to the to the very last point uh, architectures or functions or whatever, but trying being able to make an an, inter, uh, an analysis or a, or yeah or a, or a discovery of which are the uh, the, the data models in use. Thank you, Diego. Sorry, uh, when I, you were speaking, uh, of course, I had to think we have to hurry up because now there's a next uh, speaker um, waiting for, for the floor, but for the cloud. Uh, but, um, well, uh, what I wanted to mention is an initiative that is promoted by the European Commission that is called EU Cloud Edge IoT, um, and that moves uh, a little bit in, in the direction that you have been um, somehow depicting from a more software perspective, but somehow we will uh, see a convergence at the edge maybe of a number of technologies that indeed uh, need to um, somehow integrate and inter interoperate. So I think uh, you have provided a very inspiring uh, overview. I'm sure that there are many more aspects that we could discuss, but I'm afraid we have to move to the next speaker. So muchas gracias, Diego. <laughs> And now we move. Yeah, Monique, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much. Uh, we move on with Professor uh, Rui Aya, that is full professor at the University of Aveiro in Portugal, and that will discuss, will present us about uh, control management data when models mess around implicit and explicit. And the title is a promise. So please, the floor is yours, Rui. Okay. Thank you very much. So first, let me thank this invitation. Second, apologize that it's actually control processing and data, not control management and data. Um, and third, trying to say that uh, after two very inspiring talks by Henning and Diego, which I was already expecting, I am always on the bad place of saying something. Uh, hopefully, and this advantage, um, you know, uh, Diego knows uh, about uh, uh, Alice. Uh, I do have some friends which are slightly older. So I decided to go back to a friend of mine um, and try to use it in this discussion. Now, what do I aim to do with this? Um, I don't really expect to say anything to you that you don't know. Hopefully, everything I will say, you should know it. I just want to go to my friend named Socrates and make you feel uncomfortable with what you know. So I would like you to reflect about what is these things about flexible, programmable infrastructures. And just to make uh, sure that we are on the same page, well, flexible means able to be easily modified to respond to altered circumstances. Now I am an engineer, easily is a qualifier, altered is a qualifier, which means not sure what this means. One, 100, one million, no idea. Programmable, able to be provided with coded instructions for the automatic performance of a task. 
Again, I'm an engineer. I actually am not really sure if there is anything around that's not coded at this moment. And infrastructures, the basic physical and organizational structure and facilities needed for the operation of a society or enterprise. Okay, so this is probably the only one which I probably will not comment on this. Now let's go back to the, the what I think what this is appear on this and this should I say overly discussed about programmable infrastructures maybe with software defined networks, right? Um, something that we should all know. Stanford stuff, we had the conventional network and then this brilliant idea of software defined network comes around, you separate the control and the data plane, you have a controller that actually basically is intelligence around and that controller is able to link with some sort of uh, applications that will optimally, you know, instruct the controller what to do in order to maximize the behavior of the nodes. And going back to our programmable, well, if circumstances change, this controller will, should be able to change the operation of the nodes because they are programmable. That's simple. Now, after this, um, we came with this story about the P4, which says, yes, the open flow, it's nice, but, you know, the programming part on the nodes is not really that great. So maybe the ideal is that it's not only a matter of, of controlling or, let's say, reconfiguring the, the nodes, but we should be able really to actually have a hardware that allows me to drop code there. And by code, I mean potentially an arbitrary complex piece of code because actually that's what we mean with programming. I hope I have not saying anything that you are not aware until this moment. And then if, even if I go to, for instance, last talk about Diego, by Diego, I mean, if I talk about things like in networking computing or including AI processing on the nodes or distributing computing interconnections or edge and edge computing, we are all fine. This is our current direction. We are strong on that, right? Now in the middle of this, it's no longer clear what is computing and what's networking. It's no longer clear what are the applications and what are the in-networking functions. And it's no longer clear where we are doing what. Um, in fact, it seems that we started tweaking, tweaking around with a couple of contexts uh, of, of concepts and have not really stopped to look at what this meant. Okay, so really also not sure. Um, but come on, between Lewis Carroll, which was a good mathematician, and Socrates, I'm not sure if I would prefer Socrates, or I, I, I went to him and tried to get some, some understanding, uh, looking at how we would look at this. By the way, Lewis Carroll was a mathematician, and Socrates, as we will see later in my talk, is a lousy mathematician. So, uh, don't expect a huge amount of uh, mathematical assurances by him, but let's let's talk about this. So this story about these software-defined networks, right? Man, Socrates starts by asking, okay, so is this really very different from what we have on something called the PCRF, Policy Control and Resource Function in, in 3GPP? Can these change the behavior of the the base stations and what it does to the traffic flow when it goes? Or if we go a little uh, earlier, does this has something to do with what was done in IETF with the forces working group when they were discussing how to break the control and the data plane inside different nodes and how they could in be interrelated? Or 
is this really very different from the COPS, the policy-oriented management that came in 98? And so if I go back to 98 and I just stop here, this means we are talking about something with 25 years or something like that. So, of course, Socrates will ask, why do you think that SDN, if we are talking about this open flow sense, is so, so different from what we have in the past? It's yes, no. Well, why don't I say, let's forget uh, open flow and let's do, well, STN with forces. Can I do it or not? Now, if we go, sorry, um, uh, if we go to what open flow did and the context of open flow, there was sort of, when it was developed, a sort of functionality, a common functionality that they were expected in the boxes, right? So the kind of protocol that was designed at that moment was constrained by that functionality. So their major concern was really the separation of control and data plane. But as I'm saying, and if you, if most of you stop for some moments to, to think about your past, these already existed. So if we are just talking about the separation of control and data, this is not something that's originated by open flow. And the fact that we keep on talking about it, it's simply because that's our current bias, right? In the end, there are multiple flavors of this. And what we have is a kind of difference in terms of the degree of this distribution and how the, this control and data nodes are structured in terms of of architecture. And uh, I would uh, even joke with my apologies to Cisco, um, if we ever had a non-programmable infrastructure, because uh, if you ever use the Cisco router and you tell to the Cisco router that's a non-programmable environment, uh, Cisco will be probably very upset with you. But if we look at this even for most basic stuff, now, if you look at, if you, if you abstract the concept from the moment that there is always some ability to actually adapt and change in function of context, then even if you go to something like physical layer stuff, you may have what I have here as a traditional network, which let's say it's fully hard-coded. By the way, this doesn't exist. And then I have in the end something that I'll call the ideal SDN, which probably will imply a full node programmability, something P4 alike. But in the middle, in the middle, many things may exist. In fact, in the reality that we have on the networks, at different layers, we always have some way of the system to actually react to uh, uh, the change in the, uh, to the change in circumstances. Now, are these very common and we think about it? Well, no, I mean, we take it for granted, right? We don't say it that uh, we don't have hope. I have here something that allows me dynamically to adapt my network to the circumstances. Oh, we have a couple of uh, uh, protocols that allow me to do this. Do we discuss it like this? No, we simply take it for granted and this uh, property of this protocol allows me to do this with networks. And then we magically stop the way we think and then we move Oh, And then we have software defined networks and we have flexible programmable infrastructures. It's not like that. There is no single technology doing this. So in the end, at every level, in every layers, we are always having some things between these, some compromises between this fully programma programmable environment and the, the fully static environment. Now, trying to move from one place to the other is always balanced by costs, right? Um, I mean, if we're talking about uh, uh, a greenfield uh, uh, implementation, we can choose one technology and overload that technology in terms of intelligence. 
if we are not doing that, then any kind of real network, um, and it was funny that Tenningen mentioned something about if you are an operator, because my usually concerns is trying to provide solutions to millions of people. So um, in any kind of network that you have, there is no simple, you know, very nice model where it will be open flow or whatever you prefer as this is the way I'm software defining my, my, my network. This is the way I'm programming the uh, intelligence of my network. So this is something that we need to keep uh, on track, which is what is the level of programming that we are talking? So when I was having this discussion, again, my friend Socrates came to this and said, well, it's, it's cool that you talk about this thing about programming. Yeah, cool. And this notion of P4 and, you know, you have a way of putting uh, code remotely. Uh, it's, it's intelligence. Uh, by the way, I personally, I, I didn't discuss with, with Socrates something called intelligent network, which will be a nightmare. He's too far away from that. So, but, but I was teasing him with his story about P4 and, and in his usual stand, they say, okay, let's have a talk about it, okay? Um, and before talking about programming, explain me this stuff about when you are trying, you told me that on the SDN boxes are sort of more constrained than fully before. Can you explain me that? Okay, can you start with that? Okay. So I we go to the story about open flow because either it's before or whatever, in the end we'll have some flows that will be processed, right? So these flows will be, let's say, we'll have in some flow tables. So we have some rules, some actions, and uh, then something appears out of that. Um, if it's not uh, open flow that we are talking, uh, but then we are talking about higher computational tasks, well, in the end, we need to address this. So, and it is great to have this discussed with Socrates because as I told you, he's a terrible, terrible uh, mathematician. So he really does not know very much. He likes to keep things simple, right? So uh, I had a very interesting conversation with him, which uh, he was starting by, so you have a packet. This works with packets, right? And uh, I would say, yeah, sure. And then you have to look it in a table. Yes, sure. I mean, and then he was asking me, and how, how fast do, do you need to do that? Um, and then I started trying to do some calculations and the is from off. You have the discussion here, right? So in the end, he sort of converged that we will talking on first approximation, something like 200 entries on that lookup table. I mean, we could have much more if we had optimized search mechanisms. That would be a mess to explain to him because then it would also imply that we need to have some sort of more static approach on the way that the table is built. The flows cannot change as fast because building the sort actually takes some time by itself. Um, but let's say a reasonable number seemed to be something like 200 entries and it sort of, it was okay. And uh, then if you are doing this P4 stuff and processing, uh, how long, do you have to keep your processor doing something? Because in fact, what we are talking is, is inline processing everything, every time, right? You cannot stop traffic flow. And unfortunately, we know that, you know, most lines really run very much the, the, the full size of, of the link. So you have to basically to be able to look up tables during the time of the packet, uh, of the packet header, and you have basically the time of, um, the full of the size of the pack to do any kind of processing because then the next process will 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 appear. Of course, you can say, oh, I can multiply the, the parallelism levels of this and so on. Yeah, you can, two, three, four, uh, not much more than that. So in the end, what this means is that if then we are processing and we are doing, you know, these uh, Socrates-like uh, calculations, then we have something like 5,000 clock cycles for doing any kind of operation. And just to be sure that we talk the same language, um, 
um, which I, I didn't told Socrates about that, but if you try to optimize in hello world, and I'm saying you are optimizing a hello world, writing it in you know assembly directly. So you have something like 20 instructions, uh, which will mean something like, depending on the architecture, uh, 40 to uh, 50 clock cycles. So hello world will be 100, 1% uh, of the complexity that you can talk if you are programming for inline processing. And this is a point where he actually said, thank you for explaining. Um, and this he said, so this is the status that we are talking, right? So when we are talking about flexible programming infrastructures on the edge, and when you are mixing all the data and computing, this is levels that we are discussing, right? And then he said, okay, let's try to do this for the core. Let's see what we, what this leads for the core. Well, at this moment, there was Plato and Plato decided, like, fuck, I'm not going to keep on on this. This is impossible to treat. I'm not going to go away. I'm, let me go back to my world of ideas. And it's actually a part of Republic. It's a lost chapter on Republic when Plato talked about softwareization on the networking as an ideal. It's one of the lost manuscripts. You, you should actually read it. So Socrates, you know, he was the professor, right? So he was not really afraid. So he said, okay, let, let's go back to the ideas. That, that's, that's fine of this. Let's talk about this ideals world for these flexible programmable infrastructures. But let's try to discuss, right? Uh, and then we started discussing again what we could look about this. And uh, well, this story about STN and so like, it's really uh, an inherent vision from something called IPSphere. Uh, IPSphere is an operator initiative. Uh, Diego is probably very happy that I mentioned this. It's quite old. And it sort of reflected the way operators looked at networks. So you have what we can, they call the packet handling structure. Over it, they have a policy and control structure. And over it, they have some service signaling structure. And these sort of things sort of um, interconnected each other. So if we try to redesign this this way, and uh, we'll have something like these kind of layers. And just by simplification, which I really like, um, let's say that we have three basic functions that need to be uh, handled, which is, let's say, quality of experience, uh, mobility, or routing, or connectivity, uh, and, and security. And in fact, if you look at this, if we talk about uh, something very, very popular today as well called network slices, um, we actually, if we want to define a network slice, we will define a network slice with these kind of features, right? So th this seems uh, okay, but when we start looking at this, um, you know, the fact is that the connectivity, when you have this, it's something that Socrates did look about. Okay, so you have here a very nice conceptual design where you have these lines between the controller and these lines between the data uh, elements. So are the connections between the, the, the controller and the data elements the same? And of course, well, they may be, but they maybe not. Then if that is the case, then you are actually talking a little more complicated stuff. It's not only that. So you have here the, the lines for the data plane, but then if you have a different control stuff, or even I'm adding this here because this, there, there is a reason, a very old reason why this, this model is here. If you have then multiple operators, you have something as well. So you need to have some way of reflecting these lines, the connection between these lines. And this means you need to have a physical connection between that, right? Yeah, sure. But if you need to have that physical connection for working in such a programmable infrastructure, how do you bootstrap? Okay, you only have the data plane when you have data, 
But before the data plane and having that, you need a fully operational control plane. But for having a fully operational control plane, you have a way of communicating at physical level, right? And for communicating at physical level, at very least, you have to have a meaningful way of communicating between two different nodes. But if you are having a communication in a meaningful way, going back to protocols one, 101, that means that on the both sides of the communications, there are clearly well-defined actions which have been already programmed to act as a reaction to those protocols. But that means that before having a flexible programmable infrastructure, I have a programmable infrastructure. Then this is an overlay. So yeah, I can enjoy before. I also have CDNs. I also have peer-to-peer. -peer. Is that that similar? Is that very different? Where is the sweet spot for me to prefer one mental way of looking at it versus the other? So basically, and what Socrates concluded is that we sort of lost our bearings. We don't know what computations we are doing. We don't know what can be done on a given point. We don't even understand that there is no black and white models. Everything is a continuous. We do trade-offs in all points at all levels in all layers. And in fact, if we want to have a successful 6G, then, uh, and if we are trying to rethink how things work, then the first thing we need to start doing is rethink how we think about the way things work. And with that, I conclude and happy to solve any, try to answer some questions, which my answers will be probably quite Socratic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rui. Um, it's nice this afternoon. We're having very interesting analogies and uh, uh, inspiring um, uh, cultural inspiration that bring us back to some epic and, and uh, very well philosophical aspects. Um, so there was a question from the audience um, that says uh, network slicing, uh, sorry, control is taking over management. That is a trend, which is also related to automation. So uh, can you imagine a fully automated world in which management is reduced to a minimum? My, my immediate answer, and looking at one of the problems that uh, Diego said, yes, as long as I'm super user, that, that will be, I will never trust any kind of, of environment with those features if it's not under my direct control. And frankly, uh, this is uh, something that we need to consider. The but problem of automation, um, the problem of automation is a very serious problem by some reasons at this moment, we are addressing the challenges of having understandable AI. We cannot allow the systems to do fully what they believe. A very simple example that everybody knows, IPv6, okay? IPv6 was designed for not needing the HTTP. The first thing that people did was let's put the HTTP because I know how to control the HTTP and I don't know what IPv6 in, in auto configuration is doing. So this is the notion that the systems could be designed for being fully automated. Yes, they could. We don't want it by very good reasons. We want to feel that we are in control, okay? And yes, Socrates was very pessimistic I mean, it was called as the, the <laughs> mascot or something like that. I don't know the words in English because he was stinging people around him, indeed. Absolutely, you no, know, that's why I made this observation. Um, but I think um, there is indeed a growing uh, push for automation on the one hand, the market uh, 
the consumers are pushing in that direction. But as you said, in order to make sure that the old network is, is somehow controllable, manageable, full automation is still, still needs a, a, a while to go. Here I see another question. Another question, and then we move on to the next speaker, is uh, why we cannot agree on a minimal required subset of features in the devices, such as they fulfill self-placements uh, self requirements, but on the other hand, but other than that, offer all their feature over a programmable API? I think this is an excellent question. Um, and basically what you will lead with this question is um, a, high, a very deep discussion uh, on uh, uh, computing architectures and computing evolution. Um, let's, let's imagine for an instance that we agree on those features. Previous the, the appearance of GPUs, and now somebody started discussing uh, uh, AI is very nice. And some guy came with the GPU concept. The GPU concept was not defined on that minimal required subset uh, initially. How do you manage then that? We can look at systems that would be able to smoothly evolve in time. Um, sort of uh, um, uh, the way we talk about genetics. And we could try to look at uh, mechanisms that would allow um, the ability of networks to uh, evolve as we do in, in, in genetic paradigms. Uh, I am not sure at all if the uh, cost performance solution or outcome of those approaches would be minimal realistic. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rui. Um, clearly, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting question and probably we would need much more time in order to explore all the possible aspects uh, for, for a, an exhaustive answer. But uh, thank you so much for your presentation. And now it's time to pass to the to our last speaker of the afternoon, that is uh, Georg Karl, that is Chair of Network Architectures and Services at the Technical University of Munich. Georg, uh, nice to see you, to meet you. Uh, we can see you and we can maybe hear you. Um, I didn't say yes. something so far. I just <laughs> looked uh, whether I'm able to share my screen. So for the time, Can it's, you see yes. my slides now. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. Please. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. So yeah. After this philosophical deep uh, presentation, I just want to go back to plain old engineering, and in my talk. Uh, address some issues we have to face when we make the, pro uh, the network programmable and when we partition resources in slicing. So quest questions we need to look at is kind of slicing means virtualization, to which extent do we get performance isolation, to which extent we can give performance guarantees, such as in uh, ultra reliable low latency services. And so we need to uh, understand impact of processor architecture, operating system, and hardware target, and the whole tool chain from programmability by software to how to map it to some specific target. In my talk, I mainly want to give answers how to address the need of having predictability for certain services, like critical cyber physical systems. I want to explain the challenges due to complexity at hardware architecture, software architecture, and the like, and the approach which I consider to be necessary, where we need measurements that are reproducible, where we systematically gain a 
understanding on bottlenecks that occur, the different influences, how to deal with uh, the technologies we have in hand uh, at the moment, like having a high performance P4 programmability and also some theory. My statement would be, we need to go a bit beyond what we are usually dealing with if we are addressing a kind of how to give uh, performance guarantees while having all this complexity due to programmability. Concerning what kind of systems to support, well, it's uh, in the cyber physical system. So we see a picture here with a small robot. Uh, sampling frequency of 100 observations per second is enough to keep it stable. Some other systems like power grid need uh, several 10,000 of observations per second. And this we need to kind of have frequently in some network control setup where we need secure communication, a network stack with worst case performance guarantees, while at the same time, scalability, flexibility, affordability, time to market. So that's the challenge for the engineers. What kind of methods do we need? Um, we kind of need to understand uh, also on the component level and uh, up to the end-to-end -end system level, uh, what impacts our key performance indicators, of which one would be end-to-end -end latency, where we see above here some distributions. So frequently we have a low latency and then we have some tail with a growing latency. Does the tail end here or do we have rare events? Um, the question is not so easy to answer because uh, at all components we face this complexity. So this is a architecture of a non-uniform memory architecture, main uh, processing unit uh, of a server, like a server in this case having two CPUs, each CPU with uh, three uh, cache layers, additional RAM uh, in the connects and so on, giving us a fair amount of complexity and of course, uh, in the way how a compiler maps that and certain optimizations uh, may be uh, activated, we are to expect a variation in the behavior. The software architecture on top has complex operating system, virtualization, some kernel bypass to re uh, decrease latency of certain flows, a lot of complexity in the drivers, and the affected uh, interfaces like the network interface card. We also have dedicated architectures in place, such as in this example, a many core Tylera architecture that is used in some routers. And question would be how would the specific design choices of such a many core processor unit uh, affect the, the performance? We would have more complexity. This is a nice example. Netronome SmartNIC architecture. So we have things like packet processing cores, flow processing cores, many IO units. And not only the hardware architecture is of frightening complexity, we should also expect that the tool chain from uh, accepting some uh, high level programming, mapping that to the specific architecture introduces quite some specific behavior. We have dedicated packet processing architectures, uh, P4, where different uh, targets are able to process it from ASICs uh, built in uh, Tofino switches, FPGAs, um, uh, smart NICs like the Netronome one supporting P4, uh, some software architectures uh, where P4 gets executed at the end of the standard server, all this leaving uh, to different uh, performance properties uh, when the same type of uh, P4 code will be executed. If we look at uh, kind of 
what should we expect for a end-to-end -end delay? We should say, yeah, frequently we see kind of typical lower delay. There may be rare events. We should expect the actual worst case, but the question is how to, or under which circumstances does it happen? Then usually we design our system because there are some unknowns by means of over-provisioning. Now, how much is the right amount of headroom if we don't know enough about that? So in order to progress there, uh, we say experiments are necessary and uh, we need to do them in a systematic manner. And there is quite some problems in our domain in doing the experiments such that others could reproduce the findings. About 20 years ago, we had prepared a, a workshop on models, methods, and tools for reproducible network research because we said there is a need for improved methods. At the workshop, everybody agreed there is need to do more. It took quite some time until uh, kind of progress was widely acknowledged. So there were SICOM workshop, Dachstuhl seminar, the community had the badges, but we should still, uh, oh, sorry, should still say the solutions so far don't solve the problem in general. Um, there is still quite some high effort needed to have the right type of results being uh, reproduced. And we still need to think what are the tools we need to do the, the experiments and how to deal with the observations. So one of the tools of choice would be if we try to understand the programmable network element that we use the right type of a traffic generator to put load on the network element. This is an example of a marvelous piece of technology. It's fast, it's precise, but does it fulfill our needs? Because it's at the same time, not only expensive, also difficult to deploy and not flexible, maybe not supporting exactly what we need. So we saw the need to build our own type of uh, traffic generator. It's called Moonchen supports uh, commercial off-the-shelf network interface cards up to very high speed, uh, supports kernel bypass, uh, DPDK, software control, therefore has flexibility. At the same time, supports ability of these commercial off-the-shelf NICs for doing hardware time stamping and doing some rate control. So we observed quite some nice properties we benchmarked it against some hardware uh, traffic generator. We added some nice technologies, like if we want to have a traffic that has a certain shape, it's important to have the packets that represent this traffic uh, distribution being on the time well spaced, spaced out on the wire. And one way to do this, uh, we fill the gaps with uh, invalid uh, Ethernet packets, invalid CRC, so they will be discarded at the next uh, suitable network element. And such uh, techniques show that compared to the pure software approaches, we have a fairly uh, accurate uh, timing achieved. We used that tool to generate a number of publications and we saw a significant take, take up by others in the field that used the same technique uh, to run their experiments. Um, there is more than just having the right uh, traffic generator to do uh, good experiments. So we said there is a need to automate the workflow that orchestrates the experiment, not only reserving resources in a test, but also the uh, components under investigation, and then uh, systematically uh, observing the right uh, values and calculating the right KPIs and automating and iterating through uh, uh, different uh, parameter settings. And we published the way how we automate the workflow using our plain orchestration service in a Conex paper. And it's also part of the European wide testbed uh, slices initiative. And 
We can show how we use such techniques to investigate different bottlenecks. So we can uh, look at what type of bottlenecks we face, whether it's network bandwidth limit of a network interface card or internal uh, limits like uh, from PCI Express or CPU cache sizes or certain software properties. And one example would be if we look at different complexities of packet processing on the x-axis, like simple processing, uh, less than 200 pay, uh, CPU cycles per packet up to more complex processing, then this shape would be a CPU limit. Like we have with a given CPU uh, a certain capacity. So as the packet processing costs increase, the throughput in packets per second will decrease. There is another limit which is network interface card limit. And so we would see such a shape if we have this as X and Y axis. Of course, there will be other ways to look at uh, different bottlenecks, and but we will be able to identify them properly. We frequently use a simple setup if we have uh, certain components under investigation. So like adding load, uh, Observe, uh, changing something in the load and observing what's happening. In the most simple case, uh, these are black box experiments. So we look at key KPIs from the outside, like throughput or latency, but we also partly do white box looking inside during the experiment and then observing like in which way do we have cache misses growing if certain things grow like table sizes. And we can also think how to, uh, what kind of impact to expect for the different uh, processing architectures. So a simple case, a server NUMA architecture processing um, uh, this, uh, are acting as a router. And in this case, uh, BSD under observation. So we would see low latency on the x-axis uh, and the distribution. So most packets being forwarded with such a latency and then what you cannot see very well, there is a quite long tail. And the question is, yeah, in which case is the tail how long and um, what kind of distribution to have in different cases? There are other devices with other properties like the many core architecture, which I just showed. So we have interesting distribution like some packets get processed on a well-connected core, having a low latency, and other packets have an internal additional communication cost and therefore a higher latency. And the number of cores in the middle uh, leads to that distribution of most likely latencies. There is also a question, uh, what do we have as an impact of the software stack? So we made one example investigation where we looked, do we meet the URLLC requirements of five nines concerning uh, packet delivery while at the same time low latency requirements, one millisecond, one way delay. So we made a setup um, kind of in this case with optical splitters and time stamping and device and the test that would process a virtual network function and as a, this network function uh, would be intrusion prevention uh, functionality on Linux with virtualization KVM. The observation was, well, latency properties are fine until three nines of the percentiles of observed traffic, but already with four nines, we have a violation of uh, the requirements. So what to do? And first, let's look what's happening. So on the x-axis, we see some experiment, in that case, 30-second observation, and we see some spikes. So sometimes the system causes a multi-millisecond latency. It's busy with some stuff. Can we get rid of that and closer to the usual uh, processing? So we analyzed system. Yeah, there is influence of uh, I.O. Uh, to the network card, in influence of different CPU parameters. 
different uh, virtualization uh, possibilities. So if we change from standard Linux IO to DBDK kernel bypass, if we uh, optimize CPU features like static allocation of cores, disabling hyperthreading, uh, static cache allocation and uh, NIC acceleration with single root IO virtualization, then, and here we, we see such an approach, we uh, pin the network virtual function uh, to one core and we have this direct uh, hardware supported uh, feeding. Then we have a much better situation. So now we have just microseconds as worst case latencies. We can also analyze what's these patterns. So it's interrupt duration due to two interrupts. We were not able uh, to deactivate in that situation, but their impact is acceptable. And in case it would not be, one would need to tweak the system accordingly. We have also a way to uh, analyze such observations. Uh, there are high dynamic range histograms. So on the x-axis, we see percentiles. So it's a logarithmic x-axis and a logarithmic y-axis. And then we see these usual cases up to a certain amount of nines, then kick in special rare uh, 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 things that increase the latency, but we also see that in the distribution, it's converging. So it's a good distribution. Now let's have a look at kind of what is modern uh, for programmability in the core. It's P4 technology. There are different such uh, target architectures. So we can have from kind of ASIC in the switch up to software based on the server. And we would have different characteristic properties. And in order to analyze kind of what are the bottlenecks we now need to look at the different components of what happens if we have a P4 program being ex executed. So there is an influence by the parser, by match action tables, uh, packet modification and so on. And we need to understand the influence of each. Once we set up the experiments accordingly, we can set up models that characterize the uh, impact of these different components. We can add service curves. For that, we can apply a network calculus for uh, real worst case bounds. And we can also study what's the influence of the different software layers. So if, if we have a software-based P4 target, we know there is as a baseline uh, kind of the bare software stack uh, this P4 software runs on, which in this case would be DBDK. Then there would be of the P4 software target, its core functionality tuppers, even if nothing happens, uh, we have that st uh, stack to process. And then the, it's the specific P4 program that's executed in a P4 uh, pipeline. And so we would do different experiments uh, to understand the influence of each, and then can also study the impact of different P4 programs. And one such impact would be what happens if we have a table and increase table entry size? And then we would see kind of concerning achievable packet rate, depending on how many cores we have. So here we have almost, uh, we have a good uh, scale up case, almost linear scale up, uh, decreasing packets per second, but not significantly decreasing up to a certain table size and beyond that table size, we have a more rapid decrease of packet rate. And if we look at uh, L3 cache methods, we see that is exactly higher re uh, number of L3 cache methods causes this. There are other such influences. One would be a batching property. Uh, so it's a, a DBDK uh, influential uh, batch size uh, and, uh, and batch timeout. So, so we can either look at what's the impact or see whether we can tune it. And then we have this interrupt range uh, where we, I also showed an example earlier. 
We can also ask what's happening if we use P4 technology together with slicing. So there would be different ways how to have the different programs associated with the uh, slices mapped to a target architecture. Like at the left side, program slicing. So one large P4 program supporting functionality of different slices or tenants or hardware slicing where we map the functionality of one program to one part of the hardware and another program to another part of the hardware. Partly we can influence that uh, by some settings of compiler or software tool chain, how to generate it. Partly we have to live with design decisions made by uh, the tool chain provided with a certain uh, P4 target. So we can then investigate what's the impact. So a simple example, two functionalities of different cases in two different slices. Baseline A would be access control list with a certain amount of table entries mapped to a hardware target, in this case, Tofino switch. And latency would be in that range, kind of not a couple of hundred nanoseconds and not a lot of variation. Then another baseline, simple forwarder of uh, functionality of another example slice and the even lower uh, latency for that. But this is when we just in isolation activate either program A or program B. What's happening if we have uh, slicing and uh, both programs active in the same uh, target device? And there we see uh, with two tenants, also the simple functionality has the same uh, latency as the more complex functionality. So here we pay uh, according price due to the slicing. We can compare that hardware slicing behavior with software slicing behavior. There we don't, in software, we don't see this additional penalty due to the slicing, but we have a much higher latency, of course, by a software target than with a hardware target. Now some words about kind of what we deal with when we look at these uh, latency effects. So partly we deal with rare events. And I want to point out one theory which is highly useful in that. It's called extreme value theory. It's applied, for example, if people uh, deal with high tides of water and rare events and engineer their overall system. There is a possibility to do a, a distribution fitting and this can also be applied to tail latency measurements. And then one can see whether the, the observation match to something that converges to a met, maximum value or whether it doesn't converge. And by that, we can see whether the parameter setting of a system is uh, leads to a stable latency distribution or possibly a not so uh, desirable latency distribution. Uh, and, yeah. uh, great, yep. because we're out of time. And, okay, and with that, I just want to kind of summarize. Uh, if we add programmability and slicing to our network, we need, as part of the engineering, do a data-driven approach. Because of the complexity, there is no other way than just uh, seeing what is the property of our complex system if we ask it to perform a certain uh, functionality which we program into the system. And with that, I'm at the end of my talk and I will be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Georg. Um, I think we're running a bit out of time. I don't see questions specifically now, um, but um, I would kind of invite all the Interest. Uh, there is a question. Do we have any good engineering means to host virtualized network functions on one physical host and still guarantee performance? And then we need to wrap up. Um, how to co-host VNFs on one physical host? Well, my without hard quotas. Oh, okay. Uh, 
do we have any good engineering means? Uh, I would say we do have, and my talk uh, kind of mentioned a number of methods, and I'm afraid we need to combine them all. So the, uh, solving the issue is not easy, but it's within the existing state of the art doable, would be my answer. Thank you very much, Georg. So I would like to thank all speakers today and all uh, people that participated and attended. Uh, there will be in the series of the 160 lectures the next appointment. It will be uh, between gen late January and beginning of February. The date will be communicated soon. It will be about channel modeling. So I invite you all, in case you're not subscribed to uh, subscribe to the newsletter so that you will be informed about what comes up next. And I will take the opportunity, since this is our last lecture, lecture before Christmas, to wish you all a nice break, if you will have one. And uh, we will reconvene soon in 2023. So all the best to all of you and many thanks again. <laughs>